All right, let's, let's begin. Um, today, what are we going to talk about? Um, so this 2019, as we start 2019, and we had our consecration a few weeks ago, or was it, was it last week? Two weeks ago. Today's subject is the subject of ministry. And if you are in the ministry, or let's say you have a heart for ministry, or you're new to the ministry, this message is for you. And, uh, and I thank God that when we called all the people in ministry a few weeks ago, pretty much the whole church went forward. And so um, today, the subject and the topic is ministry. And so, you know, when, um, when I first became a Christian, I, mer- I remember immediately people told me, John, as, you're, as you started this new Christian walk, the Christian life is like spiritual war. It's spiritual warfare. And ministry is spiritual warfare. And if you've been in ministry long enough, you know that's exactly how it is. And if you read even in the Bible, there's a spiritual cosmic war, and the apostle Paul even talks to his protege. So Paul was the mentor to Timothy, and he tells Timothy, Timothy, you need to be a good servant by being a good soldier. You need to think like a good soldier. You need to act like a good soldier. And even Paul, at the end of his life, he knew he was going to die, and he told Timothy, Timothy, I ran the race and I fought the good fight like a good soldier. The Christian life, you have to think of it like it's war, and you have to approach it like a good soldier, fighting the good fight. And that's a reality, because Satan and demons are real. They're not not make-believe fairy tales. That They are real, and they're walking around this world seeking someone to devour, seeking lives to destroy. And so spiritual warfare is real. And so when you think about it, in our ministry, what's at stake? Where people are spending eternity is at stake. Where people are spending eternity are at stake. How many people do we know are unsaved? How many people do we know that if they died today, they died tonight, they would spend an eternity in torment, separated from Christ? Today, they are separated from Christ. And if they died today, that separation would be permanent. That's what's at stake here. There are people all around us on the verge of an abyss of eternal torment. And the apostle Paul says, he says, in their case, the God of this world, Satan, has blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ. So behind all all these unbelievers is Satan who is blinding the minds of unbelievers from seeing the glory of Christ. That's what's going on in the spiritual realm. And that's why we have to engage in spiritual battle. That's the enemy. And to make matters worse, and if you can actually project the the next slide. Actually, yeah, that's fine. Actually, you can go back to the previous slide. (laughs) To make matters worse. See, I thought, I used to think that it was just the unbelievers that I have to worry about. I I used to not worry about Christians because I thought, oh, you're saved, you're good. I spent all my time worrying about unbelievers as a young Christian, thinking I just need to, to minister to them and spend all my energy ministering to them. Little did I know, little did I discover, soon did I discover that how much of the church, how much of the people inside the church professing Christians are also being blinded to the glory of Christ. Like I became a Christian nine years ago and I started with so many people, had all these Bible studies with with these passionate, godly men and women. And today, how many of them do I hear about are backslidden? How many of them are totally far from Christ? Because Satan, who is out there to steal, kill, and destroy, is even going into churches, blinding the minds of us from the glory of Christ. And so I bring all this up because the enemy works 24 hours, seven days a week, 365 days a year to keep people away from the author of life, away from the source of life, life himself, Jesus Christ, to blind them from the one and only person who can save their souls. And if we're going to give people Jesus, if we're going to give people life, living water, it's going to come at the cost of our own blood, sweat, and tears. It's not going to come laid out for us. It's going to come at the cost of our blood, sweat, and tears. And so as I say this, what I know is that everyone in this room who loves Jesus, when I say that, you're like, amen, where do I sign up, Brother John? Lay down my life for Jesus, amen. I'm totally willing to lay down my life for the cause of Christ. You know why, Brother John? Because Christ is worth it. People being saved is worth it. To give up my life and lay down my life for the salvation of souls, that is worth it. That is worth it. 
But at the same time, if you're in this room and you're saying, uh, not for me, Brother John. I'm totally content with just going to church on Sundays, attending church, and I pray here and there only when I need something. I'm totally content with that. I'm happy with that. If that's you and you don't see it as worth it, if that's you, the reason why, the reason why is because you don't see Christ as worthy. And the reason why you don't see Christ as worthy is because you've never seen his glory. And the reason why you've never seen his glory is because your heart has been blinded. And so my job as a pastor isn't to go around and offend people and yell at people and get mad at people. My job as a pastor is to be truthful with you, to give you the truth, and then it's up to you to decide how you respond to that truth. And so there's two kind of Christians that attend church. They're the Christians who say, I laid down my life for Jesus. I give my life for Jesus because he's worth it, and he's worthy. And then there's, the, there's other Christians who say, uh, lukewarm, just going through the motions because of routine. And the ones who lay down their lives for Christ are simply those who have encountered and seen the glory of God. And those who are lukewarm are simply those who just haven't. It's plain and simple. That's it. Because it's impossible to encounter the living God and walk away and be casual and be the same. It's utterly impossible to encounter the living God, to see his glory, and then walk away casually as if everything was the same. And so if this is you, you're the one who, who you, you're not willing to lay down your life for the cause of Christ because you haven't seen his glory. I beg you and I plead with you, before the day ends today, get on your knees and beg God to take away the blindness from your heart. Beg God to remove that blindness until he does. Like, I don't know what are the things that are worth a lot to you, that have value in your life, but if you took everything that was valuable to you, everything that you cherish, and you put it on a weight scale, and not just you, let's say everyone in this church put everything that was valuable to them on a weight scale. Everyone in the world put everything that, that was valuable to them on a weight scale. And you weighed it, and then you put Christ on the other side, he would still outweigh all of that. Because he is worthy. He is worth everything. And he is worth us laying down our lives for him, for the cause of Christ. And so, <clears throat> sorry. And so God has given us this wonderful pl privilege and honor to be ones who give Christ to the world. But just as much as we want to give people Christ, there's a conflict because the enemy is working double time, 24 hours, seven days a week to put people away from Christ and to blind them from his glory. Hence, I repeat, in their case, the God of this world, Satan, has blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ. So if you really want our loved ones to be saved, if you really want our loved ones to be saved, then it means putting on our spiritual armor. It means holding the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. And it means getting your knees dirty, being a man and woman of prayer, and means blood, sweat, and tears in the ministry. And so how many of you are on social media and you've seen some new fad called the 10-year challenge? Or is that just me? <laughs> So obviously there's a new fad called the 10-year challenge, and you put two pictures. There's one of you 10 years ago, and you see how well you've aged or how different you are, and that's like the new fad. How many of you did that? Okay, me neither. So that's like the new fad. Um, and so what I'm saying is this. As a pastor, my responsibility, because we all have different roles, right? We all were the hands, feet, the, hand, the, the head, mouth, ears. We all have different roles. My role and my responsibility as a pastor of this church is to make sure if we did a 10-year challenge, actually backtrack. By the way, the title of our, of our message, Who Can Move the Ark? All right, go for it. Keep on going. Keep on going. <laughs> my, my responsibility, go back. <laughs> go back. You're good. My responsibility is 10-year challenge is to get you from here to here. That's my goal. That's my responsibility, is to get you from there to there. Does it have to take 10 years? No. But my goal is to get everyone from there to there. From this kind of Christian to that kind of Christians. When demons look at you in the spiritual realm, because it's spiritual warfare, when demons look at you, do they see this and they laugh? Or do they see that and get nervous? You know, if the gates of hell had, let's say they had the hell's most wanted list and they showed pictures 
of all the Christians that were causing problems for them. And the, in, on the most wanted hit list, you'd see guys like the Apostle Paul, the 12 disciples, you'd see Stephen the martyr, you'd see Apollos, Barnabas, Timothy. For instance, in the book of Acts, there was actually a story in the book of Acts. There was a, a, a man possessed by demons, and then someone came, and they tried to cast out the demon. And the demon said, Paul, uh, Jesus I know, Paul I know, but who are you? And then they beat him up. And so my question to you is, would your names be on that list? As Christians today, would your names be on that list? Say every morning, let's pretend, let's say in hell. Every morning, Satan gathers all the demons, and before he deploys them onto the earth, he says, all right, to this demon, he says, all right, your job today is to go to so-and-so's house, and I need you to ruin their family. Okay, to this demon, I'm going to deploy you over here. Go to pastor so-and-so's house. I need you to start, start getting their, his children to question their faith. Or maybe he says, okay, to you, go to, go to this church and start causing division. That's what they're doing every morning, right? And then he says, but... I need you to be careful, and he shows on the projector screen, I need you to be careful of these guys. Watch out for these Christians because they're causing problems. And you see Paul, and you see, you see Barnabas and Timothy, and would they show you? Would they show you? Say, hey, but be careful, all right? Be careful of, of Noli Castillo, all right? Be careful of Ryan Rea. Be careful of Tessa Batarina. You know, would, would you be on that list of the kind of Christians that demons tremble at? And so the point of today, or at least the question that I want to answer today is this. What does hell-shaking ministry look like? What does hell-shaking ministry look like? And so what I'm going to do next, you don't have to go there yet, but I'm going to show you a diagram or a picture. And if you, un- I'm going to, it's going to take two minutes to explain that picture. If you get what I'm saying in that picture, if you really just stare at that picture, absorb what it's saying, then that's it. That's my whole sermon. I don't have to preach for 30 minutes. I, I'm done. The, the worship team can come up and we're done with the sermon. If you get what I'm saying in the next picture, okay, this is my whole sermon in two minutes. This is what hell shaking ministry looks like. That's it. On the top, you have your ministry that everyone sees. But beneath the surface is a robust boulder of private devotion, secret prayer, a consecrated life, surrender, communion with Christ, humility. You are dead to yourself. You have the crucified life. On the top is a a little segment of ministry that everyone sees. But beneath all that, if you have a robust boulder of this, that is hell-shaking ministry. That is ministry. And let me just tell you this. It was this that took down the Titanic. It was icebergs like this that took down the Titanic. It's icebergs like this that sailors are terrified of. It's icebergs like this and glaciers like this that are dangerous to sailors at sea. And it's ministries like this that demons and hell trembles at. And if you just compare to the next slide, this is what true ministry looks like. This is what modern church looks like, the complete opposite. Where on the top you have all these programs, activities, church strategies, all these methods and all these lights and all these these things that just give the wow factor just to just pull people into the church. But beneath it is just barely any devotion, barely much of consecrated life. That is what church ministry is supposed to look like. That's what real church ministry is. That's the church that moved in the book of Acts in Paul's day. That was a church during the Great Awakening. See, the Great Awakening happened in the 17 and 1800s. And was, uh, if, I, if I were to share a story, Charles Finney was the leader, was one of the people who led the Great Awakening during the 17 and 1800s. And he was known that he would preach and cities on top of cities and cities and cities would just con- would be saved. And it wasn't even just people being saved. Like entire regions, the whole atmosphere would change. Like bars would shut down. The whole atmosphere changed. It was even said that 
Charles Finney would walk into a factory and he would even say a word and, and a woman would glance at him and she'd start tearing and crying because she, felt, she said, I felt the presence of God at that time. And then he would end up preaching to the whole factory and the whole factory gets saved. Stories like that. But for anyone who actually reads on these stories of these great revivals in America, for example, the story of Charles Finney, you know where the real work was done. See, before Charles Finney would actually even enter a city, before he would even preach, he had a, a friend called, named Daniel Nash. And before Charles Finney would even enter a city, Daniel Nash would go into that city first, find a place to lodge, and he would pray for a month. And after he's, after he's done praying, then Charles Finney will come and preach, and then there will be salvation, people getting saved and revival. Like one woman even reported, she says, yeah, I remember, uh, she, she, she wrote down, I remember Daniel Nash knocked on my door, him and another friend, and they asked him, can we stay and lodge here for a few weeks? And he did. They did for 25 cents a week. And she says, I would peek in, I would peek in the room at a, in a dark, damp cellar, and there they were for two weeks straight, just on their faces, weeping and groaning and wrestling in prayer. That's the kind of work, that's the kind of work where spiritual victories come from. That's the kind of work where victory comes from. So whenever you see multitudes of people being changed by the gospel, multitudes of people being healed and restored, where the flag of heaven and the kingdom of God is placed on this earth, you'll find a church like that. Like that. And so the modern church today has this completely upside down. They are strong with, with, with all this stuff, with the methods and the programs and the strategies, but they're skinny and weak in prayer and devotion and a consecrated life. And you wonder why the church today has so little impact. And so years ago, one thing I want to share is one, years ago, I was invited to a church leaders meeting. And uh, it was a prayer meeting. They said, John, we're having, they're having a church leaders meeting, prayer meeting. And I was like, yeah, for sure, I'm going to go. I'm canceling my activities, my plans. I'm going to go to this prayer meeting. It was actually, um, it was the day that, that same-sex marriage was passed. And so they're like, hey, let's, let's pray. All the, all the leaders gathered together and let's pray. And so, of course, I went. And I went to this prayer meeting expecting to pray. But there I am in the meeting. And for one hour and 45 minutes, it was just a board meeting. For an hour and 45 minutes, people taking turns saying, oh, we need to start this program. We need to start this program, this and that. And then for an hour and 45 minutes, it was just talking about what new programs we should start. And the whole time, I'm like raising my hand. I'm the youngest one there. I'm raising my hand saying, hey, guys, let's, let's, let's pray. Let's pray. And everyone just completely ignored me because I was the youngest one there. No one knew me. So the whole time, I'm like, hey, let's pray. And everyone ignored me. And finally, the last 15 minutes, they finally listened. and like, all right, let's pray. So 15 minutes we prayed, short 15 minutes. And then they take a selfie, a group selfie, and then they take it, and they post it on Facebook and say, oh, prayer meeting. And then I walked away from that prayer meeting like, that was no prayer meeting. That was a board meeting. I went to a prayer meeting expecting to pray. And you know what I told myself that, that day? I said, if other leaders are going to be like that with their church, fine. That's their church, and then if that's how they're going to lead, then fine. But I will not let our church become like that. I will not let our church become like that. I do not want our church to be the people who just talk about prayer. I just want to be the people who just pray, because that's where the real work in ministry is. That's what I want to be. And, you know, for nine years of my life of being a Christian, for that nine years, I've always, I've always really made it a point to really press in to hear what the Holy Spirit has to tell me. And every time, when, whenever the Holy Spirit tells me something directly or maybe someone gives me a word from the Holy Spirit, never once, never once, not a single time, did God ever encourage me on any of these things, on the activities, on the methods, on the strategies, never once. But every time the Holy Spirit pressed something on my heart, it was always regarding this kind of stuff. Because you know what? It's here. It's the things in here. Can you actually go to the previous slide? It's the things here where the devil's going to fight you in. The devil's going to fight you in your prayer life, in your private devotions, in your humility, in, in, your, in your surrender to Christ. That's where he's going to fight you in. 
Because if he fights you and he beats you there, he has beat you in every other area of your life. But get this. If you beat the devil there, you have beat the devil in every other aspect of your life. You fight the devil there. If you feel like there's always a pull of resistance and it's so hard to pray, it's because that's where the battle's fought. That's where the battle's fought. And the devil's trying to pull you from there because he, he knows if you get there, you've lo- you, the devil's lost. This is where you beat the devil in. Not in the little ministry on the top. It's this life. The secret prayers, the private devotions, the consecrated life, communion with Christ. And so what I want to do now is I actually want to get to the the heart of the message. And the heart of the message is going to come from the Old Testament. Um, If you want to open up to the book of 1 Chronicles chapter 15. 1 Chronicles chapter 15. And the, the main topic, the main thing that I want to pull out of today's Bible reading is this. I want to talk about a principle from the Old Testament a principle and a truth that is so foundational. Foundational being that it's from the Old Testament and it's a theme throughout the rest of Scripture. So foundational to your ministry and so foundational to your own life. It's something that if this is missing in your life, if this is not a reality in your life, you're going to be running in circles wondering how come your ministry is not working? How come your ministry is dying? How come your faith is dying? It's so foundational. In the Old Testament... There was this thing called, in the Old Testament, there was this thing. It was the most sacred object in all of Israel. It was so sacred that you had to cover it. If you moved it, you had to cover it. It was so sacred that no one was allowed to touch it. If you touched it, you died. Matter of fact, there was one story of someone who touched it, and he dropped dead in front of everyone. And that object is called the Ark of the Covenant. The most sacred object in all of Israel was the Ark of the Covenant of the covenant. And when you read about the stories of Israel, whenever they would, they would carry it, they would cross the river Jordan. And the minute the Ark of the Covenant passed the river Jordan, the water split. It says that they would walk around the walls of Jericho seven times with the Ark of the Covenant and down, bam, the walls just went falling down. See, the Ark of the Covenant was always associated with the very presence and glory of God. The Ark of the Covenant was always associated with the weight and presence and glory of God. And here's what the message is going to drill on today and focus on. Being that this was the most sacred object of Israel, in Israel, it also says there's only one kind of people, one group of people, who was allowed to carry the Ark. There's only one group of people in all of Israel who was allowed to carry the Ark. They couldn't touch it. But they could take it by the poles and they could lay it on the shoulders. Only one group of people can carry the Ark of the Covenant, the glory of God and the weight of of his presence. Only one group of people. And so that's why I called the message today, who can carry the Ark? Who can carry the Ark? And this is going to be my theme for ministry. Who can carry the Ark? When God says there's only one group of people who can carry the Ark, no one else, that's God's way of saying this. He's saying there's only one kind of person today, one kind of Christian where the weight of his presence and the weight of his glory will rest on their shoulders and God will move with you. Only one kind of Christian where the weight of God's glory will rest on your shoulders and he will move with your ministry. If you are not like this person, his glory will not move with your ministry. The reason why I focus on this is because there are too many ministries that move without the Ark of the Covenant. They move without the glory of God. That's why they have to resort to strategies and methods and programs because they don't have the glory of God with them. So the title of today is, is Who Can Move the Ark? Who Can Move the Ark? And so if we can open up our Bibles, 1 Chronicles chapter 15. We're going to read verses 2 to 15. And we'll begin here. It says, Verse 2, then David said that no one but the Levites may carry the ark of God. For the Lord had chosen them to carry the ark of the Lord and to minister to him forever. And David assembled all Israel at Jerusalem to bring up the ark of the Lord to its place, which he had prepared for it. 
I'm going to continue on reading. It's not going to be on, on the screen. And David gathered together the sons of Aaron and the Levites, verse 5, of the sons of Kohath, Uriel the chief, with 120 of his brothers, of the sons of Merari, Isaiah the chief, with 220 of his brothers, of the sons of Gershom, Joel the chief, with 130 of his brothers, of the sons of Elisaphan, Shemaiah the chief, with 200 of his brothers, of the sons of Hebron, Iliel the chief, with 80 of his brothers, of the sons of Uziel, Aminadab the chief, with 112 of his brothers, in verse 11, and it's going to show up here. Then David summoned the priests, Zadok and Abiathar, and the Levites, Uriel, Isaiah, Joel, Shemaiah, Iliel, and Aminadab, and said to them, you are the heads of the fathers' houses of the Levites. Consecrate yourselves, you and your brothers, so that you may bring up the ark of the Lord, the God of Israel. So the place that I have prepared for it, because you did not carry it the first time, the Lord our God broke out against us because we did not seek him according to the rule. So the priests and the Levites consecrated themselves to bring up the ark of the Lord, the God of Israel. And the Levites carried the ark of God on their shoulders with poles, as Moses had commanded, according to the word of the Lord. And so who can move the ark? The Levites. The Levites. The only people who were allowed to carry the ark were the Levites. And today, what does that mean for us today? The only people, the only ministries that God will profoundly bless and have his hands upon where his glory and his presence and the weight of it just rests on your ministry and moves when you move are ministries that are carried on the shoulders of men and women who have Levitical hearts. It's that simple. Ministries that where the glory of God will rest on and the power and presence of God will rest are ministries that are carried on the shoulders of men and women who have Levitical hearts. And so my question to you is, do you have a Levitical heart? Do you have a Levitical heart? Or do you just do ministry because you have to, because that's what Christians do? Or do you have a Levitical heart? Or maybe you're new to the Bible and you're like, John, what is a Levitical heart? What is a Levite? I don't know what that is. And that's an excellent question. Levites. Who are Levites? Levites. Levites were one of the 12 tribes of Israel, and they were chosen by God to be those that would minister in the temple day and night, night and day. And the temple was their life. They were the ones who spent the majority of their time, the majority of their life near the mercy seat by the Holy of Holies, and they're the ones who live closest to the throne of God. Their whole life was in the temple, in the tabernacle. And in the Holy of Holies, they spent most of their time right, most of their time right there by the Holy of Holies, by the presence of God. They lived closest to the throne. So my question to you is, do you have a Levitical heart? Do you live your life near the throne of God? Do you spend most of your time at the mercy seat? Are you like Mary who sits at the feet of Jesus just listening to him? Do you have that heart of Mary where you're just sitting at Jesus' feet, falling in love with everything he says? Do you have that heart that, that is just so close to the presence of God every day? Because that's a Levitical heart. Like for example, if I, said, if I said this right here is the presence, this is the throne room, the presence of God, right here. And you can, if I were to say you can place yourself anywhere near that throne, where would you place yourself? Would you place yourself here? Would you place yourself here? Would you place yourself here? Where would you place yourself? The person with a Levitical heart would say they live right here. That's where they live their lives, right by the throne of God. They spend most of the time by the throne of God. Levites were always in the tabernacle burning incense, which was a symbol of their constant prayer. So they lived closest to the mercy seat and they were in constant, unceasing prayer. Someone who has a Levitical heart has a life that is just drenched in prayer. Drenched in prayer. That's their life, given over to prayer. If I ask you right now, how's your prayer life? How, what would you say? How's your prayer life? And you know, most of us, when we measure our prayer life, we measure it by time, right? Like, oh, you know, I, I spend an hour here, spend two hours here, spend 30 minutes here, and we measure it by time. And that's fine. And that's fine. But what I believe, I think what's a more accurate way to measure our prayer life isn't by length of time, but by how much of your heart is immersed. That's how we measure our prayer life. So let's say prayer, 
Let's say prayer is like a body of water, right? Let's say prayer is like a body of water. And so if I were to ask you, how's your prayer life based on this? Let's say prayer is a body of water, and on one end of the spectrum, there's like a puddle where you kind of just like kind of are in it sometimes. Sometimes I say grace over my meals, you know, that's like a puddle prayer life. Maybe you're in the kiddie pool, you have that, you're still a baby Christian, and you're like in the kiddie pool of prayer. Not fully immersed, but just kind of praying here and there. Or maybe you got your feet in the water. Or maybe you're kind of swimming five feet deep. Or maybe you're more than 10 feet deep, deep diving, fully immersed in the presence of God in prayer. Which one, where would you find yourself on the spectrum that describes your prayer life? Because people with a Levitical heart, obviously on this side, someone who's a lukewarm Christian who just goes to church on Sundays and does everything by routine, are obviously on this side. How would you describe your prayer life? And if water was symbolic of the presence of God, how many of you walked into this church this morning and you were just dripping with water all over the floor? How many, how, how many of you guys are living a prayer life where you're just dripping of God's presence? That you walk out of your house, you walk out of your prayer closet, and you're just dripping of the presence of the Lord. That's so, someone with a Levitical heart. Because the power of prayer isn't about how much time you give it, It doesn't come from the length of time, but it comes from how immersed your heart is in God. That's where the power of prayer comes. And that's why the Bible says there's prayer and then there's fervent prayer. There's prayer and then there's fervent prayer. Fervent prayer doesn't mean it's loud. It doesn't mean that it's long. Fervent prayer just means this is fully engaged when you pray. And that's the kind of prayer that moves mountains. That's the powerful prayer. And so if I were to continue... 1 Chronicles 15, 12. It says, Then David summoned the priests, Zadok and Abiathar, and the Levites, Uriel, Isaiah, Joel, Shemaiah, Eliel, and Aminadab, and said to them, You are the heads of the fathers' houses of the Levites. Consecrate yourselves. Consecrate yourselves. You and your brothers, so that you may bring up the ark of the Lord, the God of Israel, to, to the place that I've prepared. What do they do? Consecrate themselves. Levites. People with Levitical hearts are men and women who are consecrated. These are people who, who they don't, God is not just a part of their life. These are men and women who say every decision in their whole life, where you live, where you go to school, where you work, who you marry, your family life, how you raise your kids, how you treat your finances, everything revolves around God at the center. Jesus isn't just, your li- Jesus isn't just part of your life. He is your life. That's consecration. Consecration means literally just getting on your knees and saying, God, I surrender. I completely surrender. I put up the white flag. God, my life is yours. Use my life however way you want it. Everything about my life, I just hand it over to you. That's a consecrated life. Just to share a story. And I share this with some people. Only some people know this. When I first became a Christian, um, I said, God, I surrender my life. I'll do whatever you want. Whatever you want, God, I surrender. I'll do anything you want except be a pastor. I don't want to be that God. I'll do anything but that. Um, Little did I know that as I said that, over time, God changed my heart. And he gave me a love for his word. He gave me a love for his people. And here I am, (laughs) nine years later. But the point, reason why I say that is, obviously, this was not my dreams. It was just simply what God wanted for my life. And I will tell you this, and I'll testify Although, I didn't, although my dreams were put to the side and I did what God wanted me to do, I will tell you this. Going down God's road for my life, I find to be the most satisfying. Going with God's road for my life, I find to be the most satisfying. And if you consecrate your life and you surrender and say, God, whatever your plan is for my life, whatever you want, I'll do. Whatever that is, you will find the most satisfaction going down that road if you surrender and consecrate your life to him. Surrender your plans. In. See, God knows you better than you know yourself. And he's gonna, he has a plan for you that's going to glorify him and will bring you most satisfaction. Most satisfaction. Consecrate your life and surrender to him. You know, consecration also means that from this point on, you are building your life on this foundation. This. 
And I believe that sometimes when we become Christians, sometimes God allows our lives to fall apart. He does. But it's not to destroy us. It's because he's clearing the way so that we can rebuild our lives, build our lives from scratch, but with this as the foundation, as the foundation. Consecration means that from now on, from this point on, your counsel, your guides are going to come from here. All the advice you got from your friends, from celebrities, from your, the motivational life coaches, the self-help books, clear it off the table. From now on, your advice and your counsel in life comes from this. The man of God and the woman of God is a woman and man who is governed by this book, by this, by the word of God. And so I've gotten my fair share of criticism letting this be the governance of my life. I got my fair share. People always say things like, oh, why are you limiting yourself to some book? Why are you restricting yourself to that? Well, you know, my life, I'm not restricted by rules and some old ancient book. I, I do whatever I want. I'm free. I'm a free spirit, and I do whatever my heart desires. But you, John, you're like restricting yourself to this book, and they have it completely upside down. To them, they think the Bible is something that you're chained to, and so they cut it off thinking they're set free because now they don't have rules and regulations in their life. They think it's a chain that's limiting themselves. Unknowing it's not a chain, it's an umbilical cord that connects you to life. Little do they know that. Matter of fact, it's being grounded in here that makes you free. A freedom that every soul is looking for. And I'm someone who loves illustrations. I love metaphors. That's how I think. And so I love this metaphor. Anyone ever flown a kite before? As a kid, you guys flown kites? Matt has? Only Matt has? Ryan has? See, the thing about kites is it's really neat. Imagine a kite just soaring through the air at the beach, flying and doing all these tricks. And there's this cord, this string, because it's grounded at the bottom. Grounded at the bottom. And imagine the kite has a mind of its own. The kite says, well, you know what? If I could just cut the string off, I'll be set free to do whatever I want. So the kite cuts off its own string. What happens? Comes soaring down. See, the truth is when people cut themselves off from the word of God, they think they're going to be free when they really are just start, going to start crashing down in life. But it's those who are grounded and anchored in the word of God who are soaring spiritually, who reach heights of the heights of God and experience of freedom that everyone wants to experience. Being rooted and grounded on the word of God. Being consecrated means from now on, your life is built on this. And so for my next point I want to make, I just want to continue. Actually, I'll just, I'll just tell it to you. So the, in the story of First Chronicles, when David was telling them to put the ark on the shoulders and move it to Jerusalem, who's ever read that story before? And I think the youth have, because we, we've been reading that in our devotions, right? And so the story goes, David has this idea. He says, well, I'm going to move the cart to Jerusalem. I mean, I'm sorry. I'm going to move the ark to Jerusalem, but I have this really great idea. Let's put the ark on a new cart with wheels, and let's have an oxen pull it. And so now we have an efficient way to move the ark, and it's easy, it's efficient. And what ends up happening, they move the ark, the oxen stumbles, and the ark's going to fall, and then someone's like, oh, he tries to hold it up, and he touches it, and he dies. This whole disaster. All that whole, the whole disaster would have been avoided if David actually just followed what God told him to do. God never told him, put the ark on a cart. But in David's head, oh, that's, it's efficient, it's easy, we don't have to lug it around, it's easy. If you notice, in that time period, all the nations around them, it was their custom that for their gods that they worship, they put them on carts. So David borrowed the idea from the world and applied it to Israel. And so what is God's point when he says, I didn't tell you to put it on a cart. Even though you think it's efficient, it's, it's, it's smart, I didn't tell you to put it on a cart. I told you to put it on the shoulders of the Levites. They're the only ones who can move the ark. So what is God's point about his glory? Sometimes we want to move our ministries on a cart. We pull strategies from the world. We pull methods from the world and say, oh, our ministry is going to be like that. God says, I never meant for my ministry to be on the strategies of that, from the world. I meant for my ministries, the glory of God, to rest not on methods, but on the shoulders of men and women who are consecrated. The anoint, God doesn't anoint methods. He anoints men and women who are consecrated. 
He doesn't anoint strategies. He anoints men and women who are consecrated. I heard one preacher put it this way. He says, while the church is looking for better methods, God is looking for better men. God anoints men and women. That's who he anoints. Not methods, not strategies. Men and women who are totally, completely consecrated and given over to him. Those are the ones where the glory of God rests on. And those are the ones who move ministries. Those are the ones in ministry where the glory of God moves with. And so to repeat it, the weight of God's glory rests on the shoulders of men and women who have been completely consecrated to him. And ministry becomes powerful when it's moved by men and women who carry this on their shoulders. Next point, consecration. Consecration means your whole heart is his. Your whole heart is his. It means you're seeking God with your entire heart, your soul, your mind, and all your strength. I remember one, one pastor, he, said, he, said, um, he shared this story. He said, he says, one Sunday morning, God gave him a vision. God gave him a vision. And that vision, he said he was at home and he was with his grandson. And, that, and, while, and his grandson said, you know, can I play in the, in the, in the yard in front? And he says, yeah, for sure. Of course. He, so, he's, so his grandson's playing in the yard in front and he's watching his grandson. But as he's playing, he says, a man comes and he snatches his grandson and he runs. Takes his grandson and runs. So the pastor, in his vision, is chasing after this man. Chasing after him at full speed, sweating, desperate to reach his grandson. And he says, the man stops and he turns around and he gives back his grandson. And he tells the pastor, the, God, the voice of God says, I want you to chase me with that kind of passion. I want you to chase me with that kind of passion. I have a question for you. How many of you are chasing God with that kind of passion? Are you kind of like, oh, I'll get to God whenever I can? Or are you so desperate for him that you're chasing him with that kind of passion? Because it's those kind of Christians who desire God that much that they seek him with that kind of passion. It's those kind of Christians that God wants his glory to rest on. It's those kind of Christians who lead powerful ministries because God's glory rests on those kind of men and women. And so God doesn't bless talent. He doesn't bless skill. But he does bless a heart that loves. A heart that loves him and a heart that loves his people. If you have a heart that loves God and a heart that genuinely loves his people, he will bless your ministry. He will honor that just because you have love in your heart. Love for God and love for people you minister to are a big deal to God. And one more thing, we're almost at the end. One more thing about the Levites. The Levites are a really neat group of people to study. You can learn a lot from the Levites. One more thing about the Levites. If you were to walk into the temple and see the Levites at work, you'd think it's a, a nice furnished temple. Everything looks beautiful, and it does. It did. But you walk into the temple, and you know what you're going to find? You're going to find blood everywhere. Blood everywhere, on the tabernacle, on the altar, on the walls, because they were constantly sacrificing animals, sprinkling blood everywhere. The Levites were experts in blood, and they had blood on their hands constantly, constantly sacrificing animals. Blood in the temple. So blood was a part of their worship. And what does this tell us? The, the life of true worship is a life full of blood. The blood of Christ over your life, and not just that, the blood of your own self-denials. The blood of your own self-sacrifice. You know, Jesus says, take up your cross and follow me. A true passionate worshiper is familiar, familiar with dying to self, picking up your cross, and dying with Christ. The difference between a worshiper of Christ and everyone else is everyone else wakes up in the morning and they look in the mirror and they say, you are amazing. You are awesome. It's all about you. You go chase after your dreams. You got this. But the worshiper of Christ wakes up in the morning. He doesn't look in the mirror. He looks in the Bible. He says, God, I put myself to death. May, my, may Christ have his way in me. My life is his. My life belongs to him. See, on one, if you look at the history of the Bible, on one end you have Christ, or you have the Father sacrificing his son on the cross. But on the other end, you have this man named Abraham sacrificing his son on the cross, Isaac. 
And what does that tell us? You have the father sacrificing his son on one side of the Bible, and you have Abraham sacrificing his son, his precious son that means everything to him, on the mountain, or ready to sacrifice him. What does that tell us? On one side, God sacrifices his own son, and he invites us to sacrifice ourselves. And by sacrificing ourselves, he invites us to intimacy with him. Intimacy and communion with Christ comes from dying to self. Taking your Isaac, taking the thing that is most precious to you and to say, I love God more. And so I sacrifice myself if it is contrary to the will of God. Dying to self doesn't mean losing. It means gaining and experiencing the fullness of Christ. I'll say it again. Dying to self doesn't mean losing. It means gaining and experiencing the fullness of Christ. And lastly, this is where I'm going to conclude. And so the Levites were always in the temple. And the temple in the Old Testament was a representative, was, a representative, was symbolic of the presence of God. The presence of God would just fill the temple. The temple was supposed to be a place that just held the glory and presence of God. And that's the Old Testament. We're in the New Testament now. There's no more temple. So what is the true temple? What is that? The true temple? God's people. The church. We are the tabernacle. We are the dwelling place of the living God. We are the, what's going to hold and contain the presence of God. God's people. And so my question is, if that's the case, if the church is the true temple, if God's people is a true temple, why is it that nowadays you can walk into most churches nowadays and it's as if the presence of God isn't even there? You know, you walk into the church and it's like everything is as dead as a cold statue. Why is that? We're supposed to be the containment of the glory and, and presence of God. How come you can go to most churches and it's as if the presence isn't even there? Why is that? And so I want to I close on this subject by pointing out one of the most common issues in the church, one of the most common issues that really prevents the glory of God for filling a place with his presence. I'm going to, use, I'm going to go to the book of Jeremiah. And so God likes to use metaphors to describe his people. And in the book of Jeremiah, he says this, the word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord says, arise and go down to the potter's house and there I will let you hear my words. So I went down to the potter's house, and there he was working at his wheel. And the vessel he was making of clay was spoiled in the potter's hands, and he reworked it into another vessel, as it seemed good to the, pot, to the potter to do. Then the word of the Lord came to me. O house of Israel, can I not do with you as this potter has done, declares the Lord? Behold, like the clay in the potter's hands, so are you in my hand, O house of Israel. And so the Lord refers to his people as a clay pot. And a clay pot is intended to hold something. A clay pot is intended to contain something, water or whatever, what have you. God's people are supposed to be a people that contain something. And so, and so for the mere purpose of illustration, because I feel like if you see something, you'll remember it more. And so if God's people are supposed to be a clay pot that contains his presence, how much of the church nowadays is praying like this? Lord, fill us. Fill us with your presence, Lord. Fill us with your presence. Fill us with your spirit. Anoint us. And they're, they're, they're praying with these pieces. Lord, send revival. Anoint us with the Holy Spirit. Fill us with the Holy Ghost. Fill us with your presence. But this is what you're, you're offering to the Lord. And the Lord looks at you and he says, how am I going to fill that? How am I going to fill that? Can this hold water? No. And so what am I saying here? Most churches are like this because you look at most churches and what? There's division. No unity. Jesus says, I want my church to be one as him and the Father are one. There's people who are bitter with each other people who are angry with each other and they can't forgive them in their hearts, people who are causing division, people who are proud, 
They're not, they're not seeking the gospel, the, the kingdom of God. They're seeking their own selfish ambitions. People holding grudges against each other. And so when there's divisions in the church, we become a pot like this, a pot that God cannot fill. And so the next time you see divisions, the next time you feel angry at your brother, I want you to remember this pot. Saying God says God's will in his heart was never for the pot to be like this. He says, I want my church to be one. Unity. That's what God wanted. But praise God by his grace. If, if we come to the Lord and we start to humble ourselves before one another, we start to honor everyone. Instead of talking evil about people, we honor them. We have grace for each other. We have mercy towards each other. We wash each other's feet. We serve each other humbly and with love. And the same quality of forgiveness that you receive from Christ is the same quality of forgiveness you give each other. When, when you know that it's not about being the best musician, it's not be about being the best singer, the best preacher, no. It's everyone on the same page on this, with the same goal, one spirit and one accord. When the church becomes that and there's unity and we become one body as his will was intended to be, then in God's hands, then we become this. And we become a pot that God can fill, a, a pot that the presence of God can fill and the glory of God can fill, a pot that's together is a pot that God can fill. And so to conclude is this, the ministry of God is something that can only be accomplished by the hand of God, and the hand of God and the glory of God only moves with those with Levitical hearts, with people, men and women who have been consecrated to him men and women who minister with love, love for God, love for his people, men and women given over to prayer, men and women who build their lives on the word of God, men and women who have crucified themselves to the cross and live for God's glory, not their own. And the spirit of God fills up the place when God's people start to act as one body, one spirit, one accord. And that is the fabric of true ministry. Amen? Amen.